Hello everybody, I hope you're all well and welcome back to Voice Notes with John Teresa. Oh, I was so excited to record this episode today. I have woken up on the complete right side of the bed. Like I had actually, I had some pretty anxiety inducing dreams. I've had like some really long like I feel like I'm having really long dreams at the moment and it's kind of spooking me out and they're quite anxiety inducing like I had a dream that I had a philosophy essay due in sick form I haven't been to school in eight years like <laughs> like it's getting weird but I woke up definitely on the right side of the bed today I think the key for me for trying to like wait and make sure I'm like woken up. What what are we talking about? To make sure I get my day off to the best start is if I'm doing something where I need to put my makeup on, well, I never need to put makeup on, but you know what I mean. Like if I'm filming something, if I'm going to meet someone, and to be fair, when I meet people, I most of the time cannot be asked to put makeup on, but let's just say I do. I always get it out of the way first. You know, jump in the shower, brush my teeth, skincare, just do them, just do it. I don't even put podcast episodes on whilst I do my makeup I just get it over and done with because I find because I don't mind I find it a bit more therapeutic now but doing your makeup is just a little bit tedious but I've like done my makeup it's what's the time it's 17 minutes past 10 in the morning and I'm just ready to get on with my day um I would like to thank everyone who manifested my ingrown toenail away from me because it's gone. Woo! Yeah! It's gone. I took the antibiotics, the infection's gone, the toe's looking good as new, it doesn't hurt. I'm gonna go and get a pedicure soon because it's summer soon and I'm in dire need of a pedicure. Um, oh, sorry, Bootsy's just come and lie down next to me. I love my favorite thing that Bootsy does. I need to know if anyone else's cats do this, but what she does is if I like get back from something, because she's not always in the mood to be stroked. Like she's in the mood to be stroked. I'd probably say like 50% of the day. The other 50% she doesn't really like to be touched. Um, so she has like certain moods to be stroked, but like and a lot of the time the moods she wants to be stroked is, <laughs> is when I get in from work or when I just like, haven't stroked her for a while and which does she comes over to me and I give her a stroke and she just flops onto her back and it is like the cutest thing in the entire world. She quite likes a little belly rub as well, which is very rare from a cat. Oh, I'm just so obsessed with her. I'm just giving her a little strokey stroke now. So yeah, how is everybody doing today? What's everyone up to? Is hump day on Thursday? No, you know, I did not used to know that hump day meant like middle of the week. I used to think that hump day meant like something to do with sex for like the longest time. Anyways, um, so, oh God, I just feel like the time is flying by. Like I, it's the 14th today. I cannot believe that we are nearly halfway through March. Like I feel like there's winter and look, I heard someone on TikTok obviously, because I always hear people on TikTok. Um, I heard someone on TikTok say that living in, they have a love-hate relationship with living in London because they feel like for half of the year, this everyone sort of goes into hibernation and everyone is just waiting for the summer, which mm, I don't necessarily agree with, to be fair, because me and my friends, we still do things throughout the winter. Like We don't do dry January or anything. Um, but I know what you mean. Like when it sort of gets to March time, again, I'm a March hater. You guys had it here first. Um, it's sort of like, it's that final push until it starts to get a bit warm. And today I got really excited because when I woke up, I woke up about half six this morning. I looked at the window and I saw like a glimmer of blue and I was like, oh my God the sun's going to be out today. Like I, I've said this before on the podcast, but I don't care. I do not care about the cold per se. It's like the gloominess of the cold that gets to me. It's constant overcast. And that's sort of what it's like in the winter. It's just constantly overcast. And I got a a glimmer of blue sky and now it's overcast again. And just my least favorite weather, but I don't want to be negative, but I do just feel like the time is flying by. And I honestly feel like it's because I'm so busy at the moment. Check me. No, I'm busy because I'm, I'm extremely lucky that I'm being, I'm very busy with work at the moment. I'm currently taking on around two brand deals a month, unless it's like a shorter month, like February, where I'll only do one. Um, but I'm taking on around two brand deals a month. Um, 
girl. Sorry guys, my cat is crazy. I'm taking on around two brand deals at the month at the moment, which means that I am just, I'm not working super like hard per se in a sense of hours. Like <laughs> I walked into my office at, sorry guys, my cat is crazy. I walked into my office at 10 and then I leave at four. Like, <laughs> But, you know, but because I like I'm working like every single day, I always have stuff to do. Um, I am just like really busy at the moment. So it's like making the time fly by. And because I'm getting older, I don't know, like I just feel like my life is slipping through my fingers. Like someone DM'd me today a very nice message where someone was like, I find you so inspiring. I want to be like you when I'm older. And I'm like, older? <laughs> I'm 25. Like, but obviously it's a compliment and I stalked her profile I'm assuming she's probably about 16 years old so I am nearly a decade older than her I just want everyone to ignore the completely like not nice sounds of my um cat like getting the zoomies and running around I might have to lock her away, but I always feel bad locking her away when she has the zoomies. Do you know what I mean? Anyways, sorry, I'm literally rambling. But yeah, I feel like the time is just flying by and I cannot believe it's going to be Easter bank holiday. And I would definitely mark Easter bank holiday as like the time when the city comes alive again. Like, and it's, it's beautiful to see. So obviously I want to make some Easter bank holiday plans and I cannot believe how difficult it is to make Easter bank holiday plans in your mid twenties. And what I mean by this is everyone is truly on a different stage of life. So for example, I, so I like message my group chat and most of them are probably on, I'm assuming couples retreats. They're doing coupley things in their couples. Fair enough. But I want to go and sit in a pub garden in the hopefully sunshine. Can we all manifest the sunshine for Easter bank holiday, please? I just have a feeling it's not going to be sunny and <sighs> but it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, what was I saying? So um, some people are on couples retreats. Some of my other friends are going back home to see their families. And then the others are going to a 25 hour rave at Fabric. Like, how am I supposed to work with these people? <laughs> and my friend Alfie, who's going to it, was telling me about it. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm not going to go. <laughs> like no heart emoji no um what else do I have to update you guys on in April I'm gonna try and get Glastonbury tickets because I don't actually think I told you guys because I fell off with my podcast during the winter because I was adapting to the winter which is something that I do struggle with every year I like look forward to like wearing new clothes and I like living in a country that is seasonal like I just enjoy living in a country that's seasonal um it's nice to wrap yourself up and get cozy around the roaring fire like at Christmas time like I like it oh magpie you know I like living in a country that is seasonal but obviously I was like struggling to adapt a little bit to like the change in seasons um last winter but anyways um and I I honestly chalk off a part of me feeling a bit down in the dumps was the fact that I didn't get Glastonbury tickets it was my first year trying this year to be fair and I you know I had the multiple devices but I don't think I was like giving it my all and also like there are definitely like ways in which people get tickets and I am not in on the ways and <laughs> I'm going to try for the resale, but I'm not going to get my, you know what it is? It's the, it's like the emotions of it all. It's the emotions of it all. Um, but there's clearly secret ways that I don't know about. This is my call out to anybody who has the secret ways to DM me on Instagram. <laughs> If you like my podcast, if you like my podcast, remember I give this content for you guys for free. <laughs> I'm only joking, kind of. Um, I give this content for you for free, so if paying me back is to give me Glastonbury tips, okay? Um, but I'm gonna try again in April, but I'm not gonna put like my all into it. And no, I am gonna like try, but I'm not gonna put like expect to get tickets because I might not get them. And also my friend Alex, it's his birthday that weekend and what he does for his birthday, which oh, I like, absolutely love it is, we go to his grandparents' house in the countryside. They have a pool. They have two pools. Greedy. Uh, they, <laughs> they have a pool. And it's all, honestly such a lovely experience going to his in uh, the summer. Um, so we will definitely do that if uh, I 
don't get tickets for Glastonbury. So it's definitely not the end of the world. God, you know, now that I'm saying it, maybe I'd prefer to go to Alex's house. <laughs> maybe I'd prefer to go to Alex's grandparents' house than go to Glastonbury. Like that sounds way more appealing. Anyways, um, I am also, so I'm gonna, so I told you guys in my last episode that I'm possibly planning on moving nearer to East London. I am planning on moving in September, which means we'd probably be looking at around, what, June, July? Um, So I'm sort of trying to get myself in the headspace of like going on Zoopla, refreshing every single day. And guys, I'm starting to realise that I might have to stay in North London. Guys, you know me, I'm always going to be a North London babe. Basically, I've sort of realised that East London is obviously a very sought after area. So there's not a lot of housing going. Any housing that does go literally gets snapped up within a day. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, within a day, it will say let agreed on Zoopla. Um, So, oh, God bless. I was telling my mum about it. Like, oh, like, it's hard out there. And she was like, can't you just go into a estate agent and ask them to ring you before they put it on the market? (laughs) Mum, I need you to be so fucking for real with me right now. (laughs) Like, thank you. Like, it's giving, it's giving, um, why don't you just go in and hand in your CV? (laughs) um oh I know she means well she means well um but yeah no so and you know East London from the vibe that I've gotten is that it's very expensive the places that are going in the locations that I want are pretty small but the same price but expensive I mean and the places that are a little bit bigger aren't in like the prime location if that makes sense so like the bigger places are like near Dalston, near London Fields, near places like that, but they aren't like my ideal location, you know? So I think I would rather live, and bear in mind, like these places in East London that like aren't the ideal location, they don't have like super great public transport. It's all overground. And look, guys, one thing about me, one thing about me, I'm an overground lover. I'm an over, I love the overground. I get the overground to work every day. Oh, Oh, it's a delight, especially when the sun is shining, the sky's blue, stunning. I love the overground because it's not super, super busy. I just absolutely love it. And I do think it's really convenient. But when it is like shut for repairs, which it happens fairly often, often enough for me to remember and like, know, you're just like stuck. <laughs> you're just like stuck there. And it's not like the best, um, you know, public transport links and things like that. So I know I was looking around North London, which obviously there still is a shortage, but for the same price, you can get bigger places. You just get more bang for your buck and it's more convenient um, transport wise. So look, I may not be living in the most hip area in the world, but one thing about me is I am a North London babe and I love it here. Like I really, really love living in North London. I think something that I've realized is that I saw someone tweet once saying that like, North London is just such a deeply convenient place to live. And like, that's the perfect way to describe it. It's so, so convenient. And it's literally everywhere is a short bus ride away. I just absolutely love living here. And to be fair, I I mean, the big thing for me, the reason why I'm moving isn't necessarily, I mean, obviously I'd love to move to a new place, but if I don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, But for me, the big thing is that I just want a bit of outdoor space. I've lived in apartments without outdoor space no balcony um for three years now and during the winter it's fine but during the summer it's just like I just want to go and sit on my balcony and have breakfast like in the summer I sit on the steps um outside outside my apartment and I have my bowl of cereal outside my flat have my bowl of cereal and I drink my juice and have my Miller corner and it's just lovely oh shit I just realized my food shop is due to come this hour by the way so we will be disturbed just letting everybody know is it out for delivery okay it's out for delivery it says you're next so we may be disturbed by my food shop um but anyways so I what was I saying so yeah I might I may still end up being North London babe because I just really really want an apartment with an outdoor space it doesn't even need to be a garden it just needs to be a balcony or just anything um but yeah I thought I'd update you all on like my moving things um so shall we do tv show I'm watching books I'm reading books books 
wait, plural? Is that what it's called? A plural? A multiple? Plural? Yeah. Books and songs I am listening to. So, uh, TV show I'm watching is, oh, I put Love is Blind finale, but I actually haven't watched it yet. I was going to record this episode on Monday because today's Thursday. I was going to record this episode on Monday. Um, but I work from home on Thursdays because I have therapy. So I'd rather like get all of my sort of like podcast recording, filming reels for Instagram, things like that. Do it like on these days I'm at home. So like today I am obviously recording this episode. I'm going to do like my laundry as in like wash the bed sheets, wash towels, wash my dressing gown. Um, and I'm also going to film some Instagram reels, which is super, super easy and super fun. Um, and then also my next video that I'm working on is I'm doing a Priscilla versus Elvis like battle of the biopics and like which biopic I believe is better I've only watched Priscilla Priscilla I haven't watched Elvis yet um I honestly just think that I'm gonna prefer Priscilla like I just know uh, I'm a girl like hello um and I really en- I've already watched it and I really really enjoyed Priscilla um I do find that Sofia Coppola's films lack that like punch at the end like that sort of conclusive punch that I'm craving so much I found that towards the sort of I'd say final third of the film it was beginning to wane off a little bit for me but I still thought it was really really good um so I'm gonna watch re-watch Priscilla today watch Elvis today do a little bit of research for the video um yeah so that's like sort of what I get up to on like my days where I'm at home because it is only one day a week um uh, I've been oh I've been watching Heroes who remembers the TV show Heroes it came out in the 2000s and I've been watching it with Lem because it was one of his favorite shows back in the day um, and I've been watching it and it's so good and it has me thinking like TV shows used to be so much better and I think that I look I think when people think of like TV shows being better look Heroes has awful CGI like it has awful awful CGI because it was made in like 2006 or something um but I think that the quality of TV shows used to be better there used to be a larger output of episodes like and it was just so good and I think that's something that I really miss about like that's something that I find is a real downfall of streaming and something that I really, really miss about TV shows back in the day is that not only did the quality used to be higher, there used to be more episodes, but also they'd come out once a week. So these, so, you know, when I watch Love is Blind, which comes out in batches, especially when they used to drop one season all at once, I would just feel exhausted because these are like 60, 70 minute episodes and I would just binge them all. And I am very much of the belief that I don't think that TV shows are meant to be binged no matter what. I think that you should not watch more than one episode of a TV show in a sitting. I know that's really controversial, but it's true. Um, And I think something about Heroes, which must have made it so good, was that it was, there was, you know, 24 episodes a season, I think, came out once a week. I love how they do the previously on Heroes. Um, They do it once a week and what, that's like 22 weeks. So like, what's that, like four months, five months? And I just think that that's genius. Like, I think that's absolute genius. And I think that's the way TV shows are meant to be consumed. You know, as much as I shit on Euphoria and sorry, I'm making sure my food shop's not here. As much as I like shit on Euphoria, like the second season, and like I hate Sam Levinson uh, for like ruining what was, I would describe as a really, really good show. I really liked the fact that every episode came out once a week and it was just this, it, it just becomes a communal thing. It becomes a real communal thing. Everyone like live tweeting at the same time. I don't know. I think that's just the way that TV shows are meant to be consumed. And then the books I'm reading. Oh my God, I've got them right here for you guys. So... I have been reading a lot recently, which you guys will find out uh, why in this podcast episode, but it's got to do with my ADHD diagnosis and going on medication. Um, So I've been reading a lot more recently. Um, So let me tell you guys what books I've read. So this book I finished, I started it in the summer and sorry, I'm so Jack Edwards right now. Um, (laughs) I started this in the summer and then I fell off with reading massively, like didn't read a book for like four months. Um, And I picked, and I wanted to like pick it back up and read it again. And it is Swimming in the Dark by Thomas Drew. Jodrowski. Um, and it is, let me read the blab for you. 
Poland, 1980. Shy, anxious Ludwig has been sent along with the rest of his university class to an agricultural camp. Here he meets Janusz, and together they spend a dreamlike summer falling in love. But with summer over, the two are sent back to Warsaw. Confronted by scrutiny, intolerance and corruption of life under the party, Ludwig and Janusz must decide how they will survive, and in their different choices, find themselves torn apart. So it's about these two men who fall in love during in Poland during the Soviet Union. Um, and I really, really like this. I would describe it as two different books. The first half is pretty mellow. It has like a nice rhythm to it, but it's very mellow. It's very, I feel like chill is not like the right word to describe it, but there is like a good amount of backstory, but I really, really like it. Um, I really like the first half, but again, I wasn't like, but the second half I was gripped. I was absolutely gripped in the second half and I just really, really enjoyed this book. I literally couldn't put it down when it got to the second half. I really, really liked it when they went back to Warsaw and you saw like as soon as they were sort of taken out of like that honeymoon holiday romance dreamland, um, how different their lives became. And I just thought it was so, so good. Um, and I think something that it really accurately portrayed was like the shame around being queer, you know, I, there's like, like this, sh like, I, I can't even put it into words, but I think that it really, really accurately depicted shame around being queer. Um, and I just really, really like this book. So I gave it a four out of five. And then the next book I finished, I read it all, I think I read this in a week, uh, is Sally Rooney, Conversations with Friends. I am going to say reading fiction books after reading uh, non-fiction books for such a long time is so like refreshing. Um, it's so much easier reading fiction books. I love it. Um, but I, of course, love non-fiction. I haven't actually picked up a non-fiction book in a really long time. Um, but I read Conversations with Friends, Sally Rooney. I started out with this one because I heard that Normal People was better and I wanted to start out with like the least better one. Um, so my thoughts on it is I really, really liked it. I really love the way that Sally Rooney writes dialogue. I find it to be very realistic. I love the way that she writes internal monologues. I, I really, really enjoyed this book. Again, sorry, I feel like these reviews are really, really bad because I'm not a book reviewer, sorry. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the dialogue. I found it to be very gripping as well. Towards the last half, my attention was beginning to wane, but I don't know whether that was because I was just getting a little bit impatient. I just wanted to finish the book. At first, I didn't really like the ending, but now I actually really appreciate the lack of closure with the ending because like, life there's no such thing as closure. Like that is what life is all about. And I think that's something that Sally Rooney is really good at is, is like, accurately portraying life. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. And then the current book I'm reading is, I'm absolutely loving this book. It is Dolly Alderton, Good Material. I'm reading this because I saw Keelan Moncrief recommend it and she said it was a five out of five read. And I then bought, I bought some World of Books, by the way, secondhand books, highly recommend. I'll be buying all of my books from there from now on because they also do free delivery. Um, so my thoughts on this book is I think it's absolutely hilarious. It is about, okay, let me read the blurb. For you guys. Oh my god, I forgot to tell you guys what Conversations with Friends is about. Conversations with Friends is about this girl, Frances, who um, she starts having an affair with a married man, and she also has her best friend, Bobby, who is her ex-girlfriend. And um, I think something that maybe with Conversations with Friends that I wasn't like, su like I still gave it a four out of five, I still really enjoyed it, but Frances isn't someone that I relate to at all, and I think it can be quite difficult reading books about people that you don't really relate to. I still haven't picked up a book um, narrated by someone who I relate to. And I don't know whether it's because a lot of reading books, no, writing books rather, a lot of writing books is, it's a lot of it's very autobiographical, right? Like if I think about if I was to write a book, I would absolutely write a main character and a perspective based off of myself. I would probably um, write about having OCD and things like that. Um, and I feel like a lot of the people who write books are, you know, people like Frances who are perhaps a little bit shy and a little bit introverted. And I don't know, I could, I think I'm chatting shit. <laughs> I think mean, I'm chatting shit, but um, yeah, so I didn't relate to Francis massively, but I still really enjoyed the book. So good material, Dolly Alton. Let me read the blab. Um, Andy loves Jen. Jen loved Andy and he can't work out why she stopped. 
Now he is, without a home, waiting for his stand-up career to take off, wondering why everyone else around him seems to have grown up whilst he wasn't looking, set adrift on the sea of heartbreak at a time when everything he thought he knew about a woman and flat sharing and friendships has transformed beyond recognition, and he clings to the idea of solving the puzzle of their broken relationship. Because if he can't, if he can find the answer to that, then maybe Jen can find a way back to him. And he still has a lot to learn, not least his ex-girlfriend side of the story. This is such a good book. I am really enjoying it. The protagonist is crazy. Like he, <laughs> like he, this breakup is making him go crazy. And I really like that sort of, I like reading that perspective because T, but I have gone through horrible breakups, but I have never gone through a breakup where I felt like the rug was completely pulled from underneath me. Every breakup that I've been through, I have completely seen it coming. (laughs) I have completely seen it coming. And I have never been in the perspective of someone who has had the rug completely pulled from under them in a breakup. Um, So reading that kind of perspective is really interesting. Uh, Some parts of the dialogue I find to be a bit cringy, um, but I don't know whether that's because Dolly Alderton's isn't like the best, like all that, I'm talking like some of the dialogue, not all of the dialogue. Some of the dialogue is a little bit like cringy but I don't know this if this is just how 30 year olds talk (laughs) because the protagonist is 35 um yeah no I just really I'm really really enjoying um this book I think it's really really funny and I like the pacing of it and I was like laughing out loud reading this book and I definitely want to read Dolly Alton's more more of her stuff I have everything I know about love and I'm also going to pick up ghosts as well. I just think she's hilarious. Love this queen. Love this absolute queen. Um, but yeah, so those are the books that I'm reading. And then the songs that I'm listening to. I like to put on music when I'm working. Um, so the artist that I put on when I'm working is I put on Mitski. I put on Lofi, Lofi, and I also put on Men I Trust. And also whilst I was working yesterday, because I was researching, I was just reading a lot of reviews of Priscilla. Um, I put on the Priscilla soundtrack, which love, by the way. Okay, my Waitrose order will arrive in 15 minutes. Yes, guys, I shop from Waitrose. Okay, don't judge me. <laughs> um, but I was listening to the Priscilla soundtrack. Let me get up the song. Okay, so the soundtrack already, great for work, great for work. But Nobody Knows by Pastor T. Barrett and the Youth for Christ Choir. That song was taking me to church. I am not even like religious like that. I don't have like a particular connection to religion. Um, but I like, I was like, it was making me feel stuff. Like I like it was making me emotional like listening to this song is like so beautiful maybe I'll listen to a little bit more of like church choir songs because I was like feeling it like I was like I don't know why it was making me really really emotional I was being taken to church you guys um so in today's episode we are going to be talking about my ADHD diagnosis I got diagnosed with ADHD I already feel like I'm being really annoying by talking about it because obviously I've been talking about it with my boyfriend and my friends and um my family that I feel like I'm just being annoying like I feel like I'm just being annoying but to be fair this is the first time you guys would have heard about it because I haven't actually I posted it on my close friends but I haven't spoken like oh my god spoken publicly breaking my silence um (laughs) I haven't like spoken to you guys about my ADHD diagnosis so I wanted to make an episode about it today I did actually want to wait until a month after the diagnosis to make an episode about it but I'm going to keep it real with you there's nothing that I really want to talk about at the moment other than my ADHD diagnosis (laughs) like is is that sad anyways um but yeah no I want to talk about it with you guys because I know that some of you guys will find it interesting and Also, I know that some of you guys probably have ADHD yourselves and I don't know, I just find this stuff really interesting to be honest. Um, So I wanted to run through the, my entire, oh my God, my story. Uh, My entire story with you guys and my experience and I'm also currently on medication for it and my experience with medication and I just wanna give my full 100% honest ADHD experience review. So, my journey started out uh, about, it was actually three years ago. Wait, 2022. How was that only two years ago? What? 
Sorry, that's insane. Okay, so it started out two years ago. Two years ago, I don't know what it was, but I decided to Google the ADHD uh, symptoms. Is that what it's called? I feel like symptoms isn't really the right word. Um, but I decided to Google like ADHD traits. Um, and I, when I read it, I felt like my entire life made sense. Um, and let me read, so I looked at it on the NHS uh, website and I'll read, I'm not gonna read them all out to you, but I will read out the ones that I related to. So the uh, ADHD traits that I felt like I related to the most, oh, my food shop's here, um, were inability to focus or prioritize, continually starting new tasks before finishing old ones, continually losing or misplacing things, forgetfulness, difficulty keeping quiet and speaking out of turn, blurting out responses and often interrupting others, mood swings, irritability and a quick temper, inability to deal with stress and adults with ADHD. I think the one, the thing that really stuck to me was that adults with ADHD tend to develop, well not tend to, but are more likely to develop OCD as adults. And at that time, two years ago, oh, I was in the trenches. I was in the trenches with my OCD and with my mental health. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the place that I was in um, at the time um, because I think that all these things are actually really important. Sorry, I'm looking. Guys, I'm going to go and get my food shop and then I'll be back. Okay, food shop has been delivered. I think I'm going to have this for lunch, guys. It's La Famiglia, Rana, live life generously. Oh, thank you. Uh, fresh tortellini. Uh, chopped, not blitz. It's basil and pine nut pesto. Mmm. I sure is. I don't have any... Par oh, no, I do have parmesan. I just need to grate it. I'm so lazy when it comes to grating parmesan. Um, okay, so, yeah. So those were, like, the ADHD traits that I was, like... I felt like I really related to. And, again, it just... The only way I can describe it is that it, I felt like my entire life made sense. For my... You know, my experience in school was that I was constantly procrastinating I remember with homework with revision I was constantly constantly putting off and procrastinating to the point where like I would go and do my homework as in I would bear in mind I had anxiety so it wasn't that like I wouldn't do my homework because I was so anxious about being in trouble at school I just remember school was such an anxiety inducing time for me I was constantly worried about there being homework due that I didn't know about I was constantly worried about getting in trouble um so I had really bad anxiety in school but also I feel like it like mixed with my ADHD where I would just leave everything until the last minute which would make me even more anxious so I would always do my homework either the night before or a lot of my essays I would do them the morning of I'd wake up at five in the morning and write a philosophy essay and uh, pff, like it wasn't alive so that was a big thing and then another big thing was that I felt like I just could not concentrate when I was revising I would like go I remember once I tried to do a revision session with these two people in my philosophy class and it was during my A-levels and I remember like after an hour I was like oh does anyone want to go do something and they just they were literally looked at me like I was a freak and I just had no idea how people could like sit and revise for hours and hours at a time like I just could not do it I felt like I was constantly in a state of distraction and I barely revised for any of my GCSEs. The only GCSEs that I did revise for was religious studies. And that was because my uh, religious studies teacher scared the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I barely revised my GCSEs. I had to sit my maths GCSE five times because I did struggle with numbers, but also I didn't used to revise for it. I didn't used to revise for it. I just really struggled. And I always just thought that I was really lazy. And I remember sixth form was definitely the like tip of tip of the iceberg it was like the straw that broke the camel's back where I just felt constantly under pressure so much I felt so stressed yeah I felt like I I mean I did I, I did well in my A-levels um but I knew I could have done better for one and for two I was just so stressed all the time because I would just leave everything until the last minute and it just wasn't like it wasn't sustainable and it was in sixth form that I realized I didn't want to be in education anymore um 
I was like, okay, like I, I cannot do university. Like I actually remember I went to a university fair when I was in year 12 and I was like really interested. Like I was like, oh, this seems really cool. Um, I remember, I think I was looking at, God, I think I was looking at Birmingham. Imagine my life if I went to the University of Birmingham. <laughs> Imagine my life. Um, so I was like looking at Birmingham and I think I might've been looking at Bristol as well. Um, and then was I looking at anything else? I think it was mainly Birmingham and Bristol that I was looking at. Um, and then I sort of, towards the end of year 12, I was like, oh, I don't think that I want to do this. Um, I remember once I floated doing midwifery. Um, I also floated doing like philosophy, like it was a lot. And then in in year 13, I decided like year 13 was definitely the moment where I was like, oh, I can't do this anymore. And then especially... Um, when I like towards the end of the year I was like oh my god I'm so glad I'm not going to university because I could not do three or four more years of this like I can't do it um because I've I've struggled so much I really really struggled um and that was sort of my experience with school and I think that you know because my anxiety was so bad and I was quite concerned about getting into trouble and like not doing homework and things like that. I think that's why my ADHD flew under the radar for so long. Obviously a part of it's got to do with the fact that I'm a woman and ADHD in women um, manifests really differently. And also, sorry, my trailer thought is like really bad today. Um, <laughs> um, ADHD manifests differently in women. There's also like stereotypes around ADHD that it's just all about hyperactivity. Um, so there's like multiple reasons why my ADHD flew under the radar for so long. But I do think it flew under the radar because I was so anxious about um, doing like schoolwork. So I did always hand in my work. I never like forgot things or forgot my PE kit or anything like that. Um, and also I was very much left to my own devices when I was in school. Um, for like my, like a majority of my school experience. Um, you know, my like late years of primary school, like my, most of my years in primary school and all of my years in secondary school, um, my mom never asked me if I was doing my homework, never sat with me to do my homework, anything like that. I was very much like just left to do it on my own, which is fine. Um, but obviously my mum may have like noticed, oh, she like struggles to get things done and she always leaves things until the last minute and maybe she would have clocked onto it. But even then, I don't think she would have. I don't think any adults at the time would have, you know. I was in school over 10 years ago. It was a really, really different time than it is now. Like I know that like 10 years doesn't seem like a long time, but 10 years in terms of you know, neurodivergency awareness is like so, so like guys, I cannot even explain to you how different it was 10 years ago. So when I started doing YouTube full time, which was sort of after the pandemic, I noticed that I would really struggle to get work done. Again, the big thing, procrastination. I would constantly be procrastinating from doing my work. I would really struggle to read. I, I used to have to read a lot, especially for my political videos. And I would really, really struggle to get reading done. Again, constantly, I was constantly in a state of distraction is the only way I can describe it. Um, and I would only be able to get work done if there was like the pressure of a deadline looming over me. So if I just give you guys an example, um, back in let me do an example December I had a deadline that was on the 15th from the first of the month to the 15th I had 15 days to get an entire video done you know research write film and then Kath would edit it for me um and I left the script writing. I did seven days of no script writing. I could have done it, didn't do it. I don't know what I was doing with my days, to be honest. Um, and then I would basically leave it all until the last minute. And then that sort of like five days looming until I need to film would really drive a fire up my ass. And even the four days, you know, the three or four days, I would still not do as much as I should. And then I would do most of it on the day before I was due to film. Um, so not only did I think it reduced the quality of my work because I wasn't working on these videos for a super long time, you know, I would squeeze it all into the last minute, do a quick like skim over to make sure I got everything correct and then get, sit down and get filming. Um, but I was also in a state of stress because those like that week running up to the deadline being due, I'd be like, I barely wrote anything today. 
I barely wrote anything today. And I would just be thinking about it the entire time, especially when I went to sleep. I would really struggle to sleep because I would literally just be lying in bed thinking, I barely did any work today. What's wrong with me? Why don't I do any work today? And <laughs> And when I was working, I would describe it as I was in a constant state of distraction. I was constantly checking my phone, constantly doing other tasks. And I was just, I mean, the the best way to describe it is that I could not be less efficient if I tried. And it was like beginning to affect my workload, like my work output. It was beginning to affect my mental health because I would feel so stressed all the time. One second, I'm going to have my Capri Sun. This probably going to taste horrible. It's been in my bag for the whole night. And it didn't just affect my work when I started doing YouTube full time, but it also affected, um, I would, my, like my home life. So I would constantly procrastinate from doing housework. Um, I would feel really overwhelmed by doing housework. I would often have like task paralysis, which basically you have so many things to do that you just sit there and you don't do any of them because you feel so overwhelmed. Um, and I, a big thing was that I couldn't concentrate. I think that was another big thing. So not only could I not concentrate with my work, I couldn't concentrate reading books. I couldn't concentrate watching TV. And a big thing was I couldn't even choose what to do with my spare time. I would have a full list of shows that I wanted to watch, but I couldn't bring myself to watch any of them. It was crazy. And it was beginning to really, really be detrimental to my mental health. And I sort of hit a little bit of a breaking point in the autumn of last year because I was increasing my work output and I was really like, I was like feeling like, you know what, I have the capability to put out two videos a month, to get two sponsors on a month. I want to buy a house. I want to make more of an income. I need to make more of a steady income. I need to, you know, do all these things, increase my followers, get active on Instagram, do my podcast, all this stuff. And I just felt so, like my ADHD felt so paralyzing um, that I sort of hit a little bit of a breaking point in September and I decided to book a private assessment. So let me tell you guys my assessment history. Oh, another thing quickly. Another thing that I found with ADHD, with my ADHD was that I had something called, I called it scrolling paralysis, which is basically, you know, on my phone, I would just sit and scroll for hours, even though I wasn't enjoying myself and I knew that I would rather be doing something else, but I couldn't bring myself to do anything else, which was like so horrible. Um, but anyway, so back onto my assessment history. So, oh, phone's going off. Um, so back onto my assessment history. Um, back onto my assessment. <laughs> Sorry, back onto my assessment history. So, two years ago, when I realised I had ADHD, I inquired at my doctor's back where my parents live, which isn't far away from where I live now. Where my parents live, door to door, it takes me like. 40 minutes to get to my parents' house, 40, 45 minutes to get to my parents' house. Um, So I live pretty close to my parents, so I didn't have a problem going to the doctors. But at the time, so I inquired about getting an assessment done through my doctors and through the NHS. I was sent all of the things and they told me that I needed to go there and drop them off. Um, And this was in January, February time in 2022. And unfortunately, during this time, I had the worst mental health of my life. I've spoken about this before, um, my AD, my, not my ADHD, my OCD was completely out of control and I was suicidal during this. Oh my God, why am I going to cry? <laughs> oh my God, I always cry when I talk about this time of my life. <laughs> oh my God, so sorry. I always cry when I talk about this time of my life because it was so, so horrible. Um, and, uh... <laughs> And I'm really proud of how far I've come, (laughs) how far I've come. But yeah, I was suicidal during that time and it was one of the worst times of my life. So I I just didn't feel even emotionally okay to um, go to a doctor and to talk about ADHD, um, to do any of that. I just did not feel emotionally ready um and I just I was oh god a horrible horrible time in my life but so that's why I didn't end up going ahead with the NHS assessment I didn't even hand in the uh form or anything um but I knew that I probably had ADHD but also during this time I was going through therapy as well I started therapy in February of 2022 so I've been in therapy for two years now um and again very lucky that I can afford to pay for it privately 
So, and then I thought about doing it through insurance, but because I'd already inquired at my GP about having ADHD, insurance wouldn't cover it for three years. Um, So at that point, and then I looked at private assessments and they were in like the thousands of pounds and I couldn't afford it at the time. So I decided to, I was like, you know what, whatever. So I was going through therapy anyway. And then it was in September uh, last year, so 2023, that I reached a little bit of a breaking point with it when it came to like, because I was increasing my workload that I decided to inquire about a private assessment um I inquired at two different places one of them was not giving shifty per se (laughs) it wasn't like shifty because obviously they are qualified doctors and whatever but I felt like they were uh, they would possibly take me for a little bit of a joyride um, where basically I inquired about the process and there was two separate assessments and then there were multiple doctor's appointments where they would find the perfect medication for me and they would continue to talk to me and try and find the perfect medication for me and they said like there was like an average of like four sessions before they even give someone medication and I was like this doesn't feel right and also they had really good availability like they could get me in for an assessment in two weeks time and I don't know it didn't feel right so and then I inquired at this other place where their earliest uh availability first of all they had very good google reviews second of all their earliest which I will be leaving them a positive review um their earliest availability so I think I booked it in October and the earliest availability was February and I was like okay these guys stay booked and busy okay and I'm not going to say the place just because I don't know I feel like that feels a bit weird um but if you guys do want to know and you live in London just DM me on Instagram and I'll send you uh the place that I went to um because I really really highly recommend them so I booked it and I had my assessment booked in for February so the reason why I wanted to get an assessment was not only did I want to get a confirmation um but also oh it's raining But also my main thing was that I wanted to go on medication. Um, For the last like year and a half, what I had been doing was I realized, look, I have ADHD. I couldn't afford to get an assessment. So, and I didn't go through the NHS for some reason. I really don't know why it was. Um, So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do everything. Oh, you know what did put me off about going through the NHS? The waiting times, the there are some uh, boroughs in the UK where it's seven year wait for an ADHD assessment. Uh, one of my friends had to wait over two years for an assessment. And I found the waiting times to be very demoralizing. And I was like, you know what? I am just going to figure out ways to, you know, work around my ADHD. I am not going to be someone who says that like, ADHD is my superpower and all of this because look if you feel like that fair enough but for me I don't feel like that I do think that uh, my ADHD has made me quite creative and I think that it's made me quite charismatic and confident and that's something that I'm grateful for but also my ADHD has deeply inconvenienced me and it's made my life really really hard I didn't go to university because of my ADHD undiagnosed ADHD didn't even know that I had ADHD at the time. I struggled to get work done. I constantly was in, I was constantly stressed because of my ADHD. Um, But I did decide that I was going to work around it and see if there were things that I could do to, you know, make my life easier. So the big things for me, God, that was a huge bumblebee. Um, The big things for me, oh God, my ear just popped. The big thing for me was that I realized that I work best in the morning um and so and to not if I immediate if I start procrastinating something I will not do it so I never gave myself tasks to do in the afternoon I never did a oh I'm just going to do that in the afternoon because I wouldn't do it and I did a majority a bulk of all of my work housework YouTube work podcasting work in the morning I just got it out of the way in the morning um and that sort of worked with me worked for me for a while um but I realized I wanted to increase the output of my videos and to do that I felt like I needed to maybe try some medication now one thing that when I realized that I might have ADHD was that I very much chalked up my inability to work on my ADHD I remember I went to my therapist and I remember I'd only been going to him for like a week or so I went to my therapist and I said to him, oh, 
I have ADHD. This is why I can't get any work done. This is why I can't get any work done. And he said to me, do you think you can't get any work done because you have ADHD? Or do you think you can't get any work done because you don't believe in yourself and you have low self-esteem? Okay, gag. He gagged me. Uh, (laughs) I was like, okay, Jesus. Um, so, (laughs) um, So he said this, and I remember at the time thinking, yeah right yeah right sure but one thing which is important to know is that people who have ADHD they are more likely to have anxiety and what is really difficult to do when you're anxious work is really really difficult so I chalk up my inability to work a couple of years ago 50% on my ADHD 50% on the awful anxiety and mental health I had at the time and really really low self-esteem um And I honestly just didn't believe that anything I was doing was good. And that's why I struggled to work. It wasn't just because of my ADHD. And I think if I had managed to get an assessment at that time, medication wouldn't have fixed that. You know, I chalk up a lot of my, um, you know, yeah, sure. I was figuring out ways to work around my ADHD. I was doing a bulk of my work in the morning, but also I was getting better at doing work throughout that year and a half because I was in therapy and because my self-esteem was improving, because my anxiety was getting better, because I was getting my OCD under control. Like I, and I think that's something which is quite important because I think that at the time, a couple of years ago, I very much saw medication as like, oh, this is going to be the thing that saves my life. This is going to be the thing that changes my life. This is going to be, you know, this is going to change everything. And I still believe that, you know, my medication has really, really um, improved my life, but it's not the be all and end all. And I think that's something which is really important to sort of, if you are someone who you think you have ADHD and you want to go on medication, it's really important to consider that there may be other factors at play as to why you can't get any work done or, why you are struggling with your ADHD so much. And a lot of it has to do with like your mental health, your self-esteem and your anxiety. And to be fair, it wasn't just the work, my workload increasing as to why I decided to get a private assessment. It was also, obviously I struggled to concentrate with my work, but I also struggled to concentrate when it came to watching TV shows, reading books. Um, I felt like I couldn't choose a TV show to watch. I was always bored. I was always bored. Like I felt like painfully bored and like, I would spend so much time on my phone, even though I wasn't enjoying myself and I couldn't bring myself to do things. And another big thing was I constantly was losing things. I was so forgetful. I was repeating myself like, and it was, it was at that point where I was like, okay, I need, I need to maybe get like a grip on this and maybe get private assessment. Cause you know, I'd been in therapy for two years. I definitely got my anxiety under control. Um, but my, I definitely think that the rest of it could have been alleviated with some medication. So I went for a private assessment. I booked my private assessment in. My private assessment cost, I believe it was either 1300 pounds or 1700 pounds. I'm going back with my bank statement to show you guys. <laughs> Okay, it was £1,300. It wasn't £1,000. It was £1,335 was the cost. Um, And let me tell you, so let me fill you guys in on what the assessment entailed. So I booked it back in like October. First of all, you have to fill out a bars assessment, which is basically like an ADHD assessment. You have to fill in your bars for you, how you were in your childhood and how you are now. And you also need to get a family member to fill out your childhood uh, bars assessment. And then you need to get someone close to you to fill out your current bars assessment. Um, So I got my mum to fill out my childhood bars assessment, which by the way, was not particularly useful. (laughs) Bless her heart. She was like, I just don't remember. I just don't, Jordan, I thought you were really capable when you were younger. I'm like, great, thank you. This is really useful. Um, And then I got Lem to my boyfriend to fill out my current. Um, And then you also fill out an ASQ, which is like an autism assessment. Um, And then you send that all over. So I think they don't like, I think they consider it, but they don't like reference it during your assessment, if that makes sense. I still actually haven't received my, um, like my full diagnosis details yet. Anyways, um, so 
I filled that all out and then you it split into two. So the first one I had a week before and it was a just general health, general mental health assessment. Um, so they ask you questions about your childhood, they ask you questions about your family, your relationships, your mental health history. Obviously I spoke a lot about my OCD um, and things like that. Very simple, very fun. Um, well, not very fun, but you know what I mean. Um, and then the following week is the ADHD assessment. And the ADHD assessment, I'm not gonna like run you through every single thing they ask, but they basically ask you questions surrounding hyperactivity and inattentiveness and lack of concentration, which is like inattentiveness. Um, So they ask you questions about, are you a loud talker? Do you talk excessively? Um, Do you, are you organized? Do you struggle to finish tasks? I'm trying to remember all the things that they asked me. Do you interrupt other people? Are you forgetful? Do you repeat yourself? Um, And then with hyperactivity, they're like, do you feel like you're ran by a motor? Do you struggle to sit still? And I think what's really interesting was that I am someone who, I don't think that I struggle to sit still, but I am sort sort of always like moving about, twitching my legs, things like that. But he told me that he doesn't think that that was ADHD, hyperactivity ADHD, that that was actually anxiety. So he asked me all these questions, I answered them all. And then he said, he was like, okay, so I think that you have inattentive ADHD. So inattentive ADHD used to be known as ADD. I don't know why they changed it. Like, (laughs) because when I tell people I have ADHD, let me spoil you guys on some tea. So I, my little sister's mum asked me about how my ADHD assessment went. And I told her, I was like, oh, I got diagnosed with ADHD. And my dad goes, the mild kind like as if my dad thinks he's smarter than a doctor like oh my god so there's obviously a reason why they have decided to call ADD ADHD but the thing is is that when I tell people I have ADHD sometimes they just don't believe me because they don't think of me as like a very hyperactive stereotypical ADHD person because I don't have hyperactive ADHD I have inattentive ADHD which means I struggle to concentrate um he actually said something so interesting which I'd love to share with you guys so he said to me that my inattentive ADHD has clearly always been there since childhood um but my I would have anxiety about the inattentive ADHD which in turn made it worse so and you know and and it's it's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy my ADHD would feed into my anxiety and then my anxiety would feed into my ADHD fascinating right like absolutely fascinating So yeah, I got diagnosed with ADHD and he asked me what route I wanted to go down. And I told him that because I was already in therapy, I really wanted to go down the medication route if he believed that that was right for me. And he basically explained how ADHD works. And I just want to say that this is not a perfect like retelling because I was, it was honestly like he was splitting so much information at me. I barely remember any of it. But basically there's like lots of theories about ADHD. One of the theories being that like people with ADHD, to put it very simply, have very noisy brains. So they struggle to get things done because there's constantly just a thousand and a million one things going on in like a specific part of their brain. But another thing which I found really, really interesting is like the release of dopamine. So when so it was like used to be formally believed that within the human brain when you did a task it would release dopamine and that was that but now there's like different theories and maybe this is actually true but i don't know whether it's a theory or not where human beings actually have an adhd human beings actually have a release of dopamine before they do a task which is sort of manifest in that motivation to go and do it and apparently people with ADHD don't have that dopamine and a lot of ADHD is like due to a lack of dopamine in the brain um so he was telling me all about that and he was telling me all about these medications and the medication which people there's there's, I think there's a few different medications but one of the most common medications is a amphetamine um and it's also known as Ritalin Concerta I am on it's called methyl phenidate hydrochloride is the medication that I'm on um and it basically is a stimulant so stimulants have an opposite effect on people who have ADHD so 
stimulants if someone who doesn't have ADHD takes a stimulant they feel really wired they feel like ready to do like a bunch of things like they can't sleep all of this stuff with ADHD apparently it has like the opposite effect where the speed helps your brain calm down um which is again fascinating this is just so so interesting so he prescribed me methylphenidate hydrochloride he gave me short acting um uh, methyl <laughs> he gave me short acting meth i'm just going to call it ritalin um he gave me short acting ritalin um because there is a chance that because it increases your focus it can make symptoms of ocd worse so he was very conscious of that so he prescribed me short acting I go back in a couple of weeks and he is going to change it to the long acting so I don't have to take it twice a day he's going to change it to the long acting um if this medication is working for me so he just goes okay cool I'll prescribe you the short acting one and then we'll book you in for an appointment in a month's time to see how you're getting on and I was like okay cool and he's like all right so I'll just write you write you your prescription and I'll drop it off at you in the reception. I was like, what? And I was like, wait, do I pick up the medication here? And he was like, no, 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 you go to a pharmacy. I could not believe that it was so simple. Like I thought that he would be taking me in for more sessions to like really think no he just gave me the medication as he should and I was just shocked at how simple it was and I think you know getting diagnosed it was definitely a bittersweet moment like above everything I felt happy and my therapist was actually really interested in this because he said to me he was like you seem so happy that you've been diagnosed um but you've been diagnosed with a disorder like I like why do you feel so happy about it I was like first of all I feel vindicated second of all it's more that I feel happy I don't I'm not happy that I have ADHD having ADHD is annoying it's inconvenienced me I it's made my life hard um but I was happy that I was receiving the support that I felt like I had needed for possibly my entire life and I think that's what made it quite a bittersweet moment was realizing how simple it is and like yeah I had to fork out 1300 pounds um to get this assessment um but it really did it really is just like god if the nhs just received the right funding this would be so fucking easy to implement this would be so easy to implement and i think that's what made it so bittersweet was like not only was i just thinking about how simple it is and like how like unfair it is that so many people cannot get assessments because of like financial blocks but also I was like thinking about the fact that I felt like I was like grieving a life I could have had if I received the support that I needed I know that sounds really I thought that sounds really fucking ungrateful and bratty um but I felt just a bit robbed honestly I felt robbed of my university experience I felt robbed of like uh receiving support in school I just felt fucking robbed of it all um but it's okay. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. Um, you know, I'm in the minority of people who can afford to have a private ADHD assessment. And this also should have been picked up on years ago. So it was a very bittersweet moment. But shall we talk about the medication? Okay, so I was, I can't lie to you guys, I was absolutely buzzing to start the medication. I didn't know what to expect. Like, I was literally like, ooh, ooh, like so excited. Like, I felt like I was like, oh my God, my life could completely change. Like, this is crazy. Because I really did not know what to expect. Um, so I picked up my prescription. I went home. I was going to go to work the next day. And the next day at like two in the morning, I woke up with the worst neck pain of my life. And I pulled like a muscle in my neck and I could not move my head. You know, those ones. I haven't had one of those in years. And it was actually awful. It was so, so, oh my God, so bad. I was actually crying my eyes out, had to take a bath at like four in the morning, uh, playing spa music, like a boiling hot bath to try and soothe my neck. So that day I didn't go into work, um, but I literally like I remember I had to deliver boots, uh, cocoa. Oh no, I couldn't deliver cocoa de mall because um you have to get it on prescription, but I delivered like sulfidine, neuromol, heat patches, like because I was in agony. So I was on a lot of um, like painkillers. And then I was like, okay, so I feel a little bit better after the painkillers and I'm doing work. I'm going to take my Ritalin. Like, okay. So I will say I was 
so nervous. I was so, so nervous to start taking Ritalin. Like, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was so nervous. So I took it and I remember I was just sat like, <sighs> like waiting for something to happen. And I just started like clearing up and like doing things, not because of the medication, but because I wanted to keep myself busy because I was so nervous. And I had like a bunch of chores to do that day. And oh my God, my neck hurt so much. Um, but the way that I would describe being on medication is like my biggest thing is that I don't know why, but I think I was expecting like for it to feel like I was on speed. Like I was expecting myself to want to keep myself really busy and like all of this. And that is not what it is like at all, at least in my experience. My experience of being on Ritalin was that the one thing which I've said to everyone, I'm like, it really isn't a miracle worker. That's the only way I'll describe it. I was expecting it, slight, I was slightly expecting it to all of a sudden have this fire up my arse and me want to tidy up and clean up every single part of my house and have motivation to work for hours on end. That's not what my experience has been like at all. My experience is that it's made my life a lot easier. So how I would describe having ADHD is that there's you and then there's your tasks and then there's all of these blocks in the middle. And the medication, so first of all, like changes in your lifestyle will remove some of those blocks, but also medication will remove a lot of those blocks. And that's how I would describe it, um, is that it has, it has made, you know, like just doing things easier. So like, for example, there has been a hat on the floor near my shoe rack for the longest time. I go and pick up shoes from that shoe rack every single day, never pick the hat up off the floor. When I started taking Ritalin, I picked the hat up off the floor. I could concentrate when I was reading. I could concentrate when I was working. I I think the big thing for me, so first of all, not only did I just start sort of getting, if I wanted to do something, I would just get up and do it. Um, but also the big thing was that it, it completely reduced my impulsivity. Um, you know, I would have like an impulse of, I want to check my phone. I would check my phone, like no impulse control whatsoever. Now it's the thought goes in my head of, oh, I want to check my phone. But then I'm like, oh, I'll, you know what? I'll do it later. I really need to do this work. That's what it's like taking Ritalin. Um, it's really good. Like so far I'm finding it really, really positive. Um, and I am like, again, I think the big thing, which I know is sort of like a good sign is that it hasn't like, it's not completely changed my life. It's not completely changed who I am as a person. It's definitely really made my life easier. That's the only way I'll describe it is that it makes my life so much easier. Um, but again, it's not a miracle worker. Like I am not a tidy person. I'm not a tidy person. I'm not all of a sudden going to be a clean freak because I take Ritalin. Like that's just not how it works. Um, and yeah, like I just find that it really helps my impulsivity. And it, the big thing was that I, it's like stopped my scrolling paralysis and it's like helped me choose to do things. So I want to play, if I like, I think, oh, I should play a game on my PlayStation. I just go and do it instead of sitting on my phone for two hours. I read books and I don't want to impulsively check my phone. My screen time has reduced from eight hours a day to four hours a day, which I think is just so insane. And I think I've just realized that I don't actually enjoy spending that much time on my phone, really. What I enjoy spending doing the most on my phone is messaging my friends. Like that's literally it. I don't enjoy um, scrolling on TikTok for more than 15 minutes. And now I've got that impulse control, like under control. Like now I've got my impulses under control. I can like put my phone down and do something else when I recognize that I'm not having a good time on my phone anymore. So yeah, ADHD, a med medication, it's not a miracle worker, but it does make your life easier and it does remove a lot of the blocks that are there. And it did really improve, it has really improved my impulse improved my impulse control. So, but obviously there are like negative side effects to any medication. So I'm going to do like a quick run through of my personal. I'm not going to run through these med neg negative side effects. I'm going to run through my negative side effects. So I did find that it disrupted the quality of my sleep. Um, I was falling asleep earlier because I was spending less time on my phone, but I would wake up and like my pillows would be on the floor and I would feel really groggy and tired. Um, but that seems to have passed. I do find that again, I'm just having weird dreams at the moment, like dreams about school. But I do think that I'm having dreams about school because I've been writing this, um, like I've been writing notes for this um, for this episode and I've been talking about school. Uh, but I find I've been having sort of like kind of weird, like quite intense, like really long dreams. Um, 
Uh, but I, the sleeping's fine. Like I've, I'm falling asleep fine because I don't take the Ritalin before 4 p.m. Um, obviously, this might change when I take long acting Ritalin. So I will keep you all updated. Um, but I think... Uh, and also the way that I take it is I don't take it every single day. I have about three days on and then one day off. So what I take it, sorry, I'm literally rambling. I haven't taken my medication today. <laughs> so I take it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Friday. So I take it on all the days I'm in the office. And then if on a Saturday I am um, doing housework or something like that, I will take it. But if I'm not really planning anything, then I won't take it. So I didn't take it on Sunday. I haven't taken it today. I might take it a little bit later because I have stuff to do, but I'm just gonna see if I can do it first without the medication because I don't wanna be too reliant on it. And my doctor who prescribed me it does wants to prevent as much like sluggishness and tiredness as possible. Also another thing is that because it's speed, it's an appetite suppressant. So I'm finding that I feel quite averse to a lot of foods and I'm just not eating that much, um, which I don't think is a good thing. The only thing that I can really, like that I'm enjoying eating is really sweet stuff and like snacks. Like I, like, like yesterday, so I went for a swim yesterday and I, all I'd eaten all day was a packet of crisps and a packet of squashies and some Rocky Roads. And like, I had the worst headache and I was also wearing a swimming cap. So I literally just felt like my head was about to explode and it was awful. So that, the like, it's not necessarily like I feel full up all the time. It's that I just feel averse to like so many foods. Like I literally walk around Sainsbury's like looking to buy something to eat and I'm literally just like, oh. Like, ooh, like, I don't want to eat any of this. Um, but yeah, I, I'm i happy and I'm I'm having a positive experience on medication so far, but obviously it's only been a couple of weeks, well, a few weeks really. And I don't want, the main thing is that I don't want medicate, to paint medication as being the be all and end all um, because I have found that most of my like uh, work was being hindered by my anxiety. Um, but a lot of my anxiety came from my ADHD and a lot of my stress came from my ADHD too. So yeah, I feel positive, but also I just feel, it's just infuriating. Like when you go through the process privately, you realize how simple it could be if the NHS was given the correct funding. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Sorry it was like all ADHD focused, but I know that some of you guys will be really interested in this. Um, and also, sorry guys, I'm running out of steam. I'm so tired, I haven't eaten today. So I'm gonna make myself some breakfast and I'll speak to you guys soon for another episode. Bye.